Welcome to part two. In part one, we learned that Adam from the Bible was the first king. The father of Cain was Sumerian Enki or biblical Satan, and the father of Seth was Sumerian Anu or biblical El. Cain had red hair and blue, green or grey eyes, and Seth had blonde hair and blue eyes. After further research, I think it's only Cain's family that follows Kabbalah. Following left-hand path, right-hand path, light and dark theory, that would make Cain's family the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Seth's family were against Kabbalah, but so many married Canaanites and were influenced by Cain's occult religion that the lines do get blurred. In this video, we will examine how the following subjects are all interconnected. Gnosis, the dragon kings, sun gods, the Kohanim priests of the Old Testament, the Holy Grail and the Knights Templar. Anu, or the biblical Yahweh, had two sons, Enki and Enlil. From that trio, Enki fell and his angels with him. They became known as the fallen angels or the watchers. Enki or Satan had Cain from the Bible. After Noah's flood, Cain's blood survives through Ham and Japheth. Japheth symbols are the eagle, the snake, the dragon, the darkness and the moon. Ham symbols are the all-seeing eye, the light and the sun. The world is run by what appears to be opposing forces. Years ago, while snooping on a Masonic forum, I came across an interesting story. A priest and a Satanist were sat next to each other at a Masonic lodge. The priest wasn't happy that he had to sit next to the Satanist. He complained to another Mason. The Mason replied, don't you realize you're two sides of the same coin? This is how the family of Cain operates on a dualistic system based on Kabbalah. The black and white squares on the floor of a Masonic lodge stand for the balance between light and dark, good and evil. Like a game of chess, they have to use the dark squares and the light squares to win the game. Think of it like a battery. You need the negative and the positive to gain the power. Although they're opposed, they do have a common purpose and they will unite if it suits them. The Dragon Kings are more physical control and the Popes are more spiritual control. The left is more Satanic Gnosticism, the right is more Luciferian New Age. Prometheus or Enki or Satan or the Serpent stole the fire from the gods and gave it to humanity in the form of technology, knowledge and civilization. The serpent represents knowledge. Knowledge is gnosis. Gnosis is enlightenment or illumination. The serpent said to Eve that her eyes would be opened and she'd be like a god, knowing good and evil. It means her third eye or her all-seeing eye would be opened and she would become illuminated. The serpent said illumination is co-creation with God, immortality. Or was it just a trick? The term Gnosticism was coined in the first century AD, but the concept hasn't really changed since the beginning. Gnosis is the quest for enlightenment. The goal is to meditate upon the sense of self until the divine is revealed. Gnostics considered the principal element of salvation to be the direct knowledge of the supreme divinity in the form of mystical or esoteric insight. Many Gnostic texts deal not in concepts of sin and repentance, but with illusion and enlightenment. They claim to represent the exclusive good. They believe in salvation through self-knowledge rather than salvation by faith, an awakening to their own divinity, a worship of self. The argument boils down to external versus internal God. Is there a God of the universe or are you God? In Gnostic visions, they communicate with a hierarchy of multidimensional beings. As we follow the opposing bloodlines of the line of Cain through history, you get the sense that they're being managed by something else. One of these beings are called Archons. They're believed to be evil and control the earth, as well as many of the thoughts, feelings and actions of humans. In Manichaeism, the Archons are the rulers of a realm within the kingdom of darkness, who together make up the Prince of Darkness. Their physical appearance is described as hermaphroditic, male and female, with their faces being those of beasts. 
It reminds me of the Baphomet on the right, another symbol of gnosis or illumination. They are builders of the physical universe. They are rulers, each related to one of seven planets. They prevent souls from leaving the material realm. The royal families from Cain and Seth called themselves the sons of God. This is because they literally are the sons of God, as their ancestors are the gods of our past. This led to their belief in the divine right of kings. The phrase Dieu et mon droit on British coins means God and my right. Chinese royalty called it the mandate of heaven. Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Roman, Chinese, Indian and European royalty all believed they had a God-given right to rule. And they still do. The Old Testament is a genealogy of the royal families going back to Adam, the first king. Every religion and every war was started by these families. They create armies from the local human population to fight each other for more land and power. Using the fear of God or brutality and slavery, they control humanity. We will also see that this breed are physically different from the human populations they rule over. After Noah's flood, the line of Seth survived through Shem and the line of Cain through Ham and Japheth. Now let's follow the kings of Japheth, bearing the emblem of their father Enki, the great dragon. Seven Sumerian or Anunnaki gods bore the title Ushum Gal, meaning great serpent or dragon. The earliest depiction of a seven-headed dragon is from Sumeria. On the left we see Buddha protected by seven Nagas or serpents. The Bible describes the enemy in the same way. Revelation 12.3 Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns on its heads. This royal bloodline are known as the Dragon Kings. We can follow their symbolism of a dragon or a serpent as they move out of the Middle East. They became rulers and gods of the primitive people in the lands they conquered. The symbol of a snake eating a man can be found in South America and Italy on the coats of arms of the Venetian or black nobility. The House of Sforza combines the serpent with an eagle. Taoism, China. In Taoist magic they use dragon energy, but every sect and lineage are connected to different powers as their Tao. Therefore this dragon energy can mean different things for different sects. We will now follow the offspring of Japheth using the Bible's Table of Nations, starting with Ashkenaz and Togama on the bottom left. In Armenian tradition, Ashkenaz, along with Togama, was considered among the ancestors of the Armenians. Corian, the earliest Armenian historian, calls the Armenians an Ashkenazian or Ashkenazi nation. JPF in Georgia. According to the medieval Georgian chronicles, the legendary patriarch of the Georgian nation, Mutsketos, was the son of Kartlos, the son of Targamos. The Georgian spelling of biblical Togama, son of Gomer, son of Japheth, son of Noah. Josephus wrote that Tyrus was the ancestor of the Thyracians or Thracians. Ancient Greek writers described the Thracians as red haired. Greek poet Xenophanes wrote, men make gods in their own image. Those of the Ethiopians are black and snub nosed. Those of the Thracians have blue eyes and red hair. Josephus said the Scythians descended from Magog. The Old Testament God Yahweh didn't like them. He said, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel. The royal Scythians were located in the land of Japheth on the north side of the Black Sea. Ashkenaz in Scythia. In rabbinic literature, the kingdom of Ashkenaz was first associated with the Scythian region. The name Ashkenaz is related to the Assyrian Ashkuza, 
a people who expelled the Sumerians from the Armenian highland of the upper Euphrates area. Epiphanius, an Orthodox Christian writer, wrote this about the Scythians. Consulting together there, they took counsel with each other to build a tower and a city. Because they had migrated to Asia from the region next to Europe, they were all called Scythians in the parlance of the time. They laid the foundations of the tower and built Babylon. In the writings of Marcus Justinus, he indicates the Scythians were more ancient than the Egyptians. He also says they were unconquered by any foreign power. The Scythians were relatively tall. This tallness is particularly noticeable in warrior burials and those men of the upper social stratum who would seem tall even today. These skeletons differ from those of today in their longer arm and leg bones and a generally stronger bone formation. Some of the males exceeded six foot six. The ordinary people they dominated were of much smaller stature. Diodorus said the Scythians came from the conjugal union of Zeus and a snake-legged goddess. Pliny described them as red-haired and blue-eyed. Greek philosopher Polemon said they had red hair and blue-gray eyes. And Herodotus said they had red hair and gray eyes. Top right we see a Scythian plate with a double-headed eagle. Bottom right, we see a woman with two tails from Cromia in the first century. These are Gnostic symbols of the duality between light and dark. The Hittites used the double-headed eagle in 1400 BC. They were sons of Cain. They took the symbol around the world to the lands they conquered and ruled. In the centre are the coats of arms of the royal families from the Holy Roman Empire. They weren't Christians in the sense that we understand it. Gnosticism is the quest for gnosis, illumination or enlightenment through knowledge, co-creation with God. A Gnostic symbol is the Abraxas. The same concept can be seen across the world in different countries and times. This is a global religion for the royal families from Cain. Zalmoxis is a god of the Getae and Dacians mentioned by Herodotus. Hippolytus wrote, and the Celtic Druids investigated to the very highest point Pythagorean philosophy after Zalmoxus, by birth of Thracian, a servant of Pythagoras, became to them the originator of this discipline. So Druid knowledge travelled from Thrace to Northern Europe. Prince Nicholas de Vere von Drakenberg, head of the Royal Dragon Court. He explains why the Druids and the Dragon Kings practiced royal vampirism. The Druids were the ultimate kings of Eurasia, under which were the sub-kings, um, whom the Catholic Church later elevated. And the Druids were responsible for the guidance of the people. They were responsible for seeing into the future of the people, for the healing of the people. They had a particular responsibility in society that had to be maintained by what you and I now call vampirism, by the ingestion of blood which is enriched uh, with uh, neurotransmitters, with hormones, with chemicals that change the pattern of the way that the brain thinks and sees and perceives in order that they may function properly for their societies. So vampirism, it wasn't practiced uh, with humans and, and druids or humans and dragons, it was purely a dragon thing. No dragon would prey on a human because the blood was so rubbish it wasn't worth it. So they, they did it amongst themselves, they kept with them in their own caste and they performed their responsible functions as the guides and leaders of their people. That is royal vampirism. It's a social responsibility. On the right we see a red dragon, the national symbol of Wales. It is supposed to have been the battle standard of King Arthur and other ancient Celtic leaders. The stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table include the Holy Grail and the Fisher King, the Keeper of the Holy Grail. King Arthur's father was called Uther Pendragon. Pendragon means Chief Dragon. As you watch this presentation, you will see the connection between the Knights Templar, the Holy Grail, the Fisher King and the Dragon. Irish legend gives Magog another four sons, Bethas, Faithector, Jobath and Emoth. 
According to the 11th century Le Bourg Gabala Eren, Book of the Invasions of Ireland, and the 17th century Annals of the Four Masters, these sons were the ancestors of the Irish kings. Irish history and folklore goes on to say they originated in Scythia and were descendants of Phineas Farsad, a Scythian prince. The Tuatha de Danann or Tuadan are a supernatural race in Irish mythology. They are also known as the Dragon Lords of Anu and are said to be the offspring of the ancient Sumerian Anunnaki. They are described as having red hair and green or blue eyes. Melusine is a figure of European folklore. She is usually depicted as a woman who is a serpent or fish from the waist down. The Limburg Luxembourg dynasty, which ruled the Holy Roman Empire from 1308 to 1437, as well as Bohemia and Hungary, the House of Anjou, and their descendants, the House of Plantagenet, the Kings of England, and the French House of Lusignan, are said in folk tales and medieval literature to be descended from Melusine. Prince Nicholas de Vere von Drakenberg, head of the Royal Dragon Court. Before he died, he talked about his ancestors, the Dragon Kings. Melusine was called the daughter of Satan, and uh, actually her line uh, does devolve back through uh, Brood and the Wild to King Vere. And then from King Vere, we have associations and connections through the Irish uh, to Adanu, um, often mispronounced to Afadidanon. And these were Scythians um, from Western Central Scythia. They were involved in the Greek wars at one point, and uh, the Sarmatians kicked them out, and they moved to Ireland. Before that, um, they were descended from the Mitanni, uh, who were Scythians um, who were living in Assyria, and the Mitanni axe lords were married into the Pharaonic line. And the Pharaonic line goes back to Raneb, and uh, although the Bible says that um, Cain was the son of Adam, he wasn't. Uh, he was actually the ancestor of Raneb, and he was the son of Enki, who the Jews based Satan on, you know, the war in heaven and all this. Now, Satan uh, wasn't an inferior angel. He was the half-brother of El, who then became uh, Jehovah. So, it, you know, some of it's uh, been mixed up and, and altered for political reasons, anciently. But yes, um, if we change the name Satan back to Ea or Enki, then yes, you have that uh, descent in our lineage. The dragon kings and queens proudly display their heritage in the United Kingdom. Here we see the coat of arms of the City of London with the Templar cross on the shield. There are 13 dragons surrounding the City of London, known as the Dragon Boundary. We follow the dragon kings from Japheth. Now let's follow the line of Ham and the Canaanites into the lands of the sun gods. Ra, the Egyptian sun god. We have the eye of Ra, the eye of Horus, and the eye is the sun. The enemy of Ra is Apophis, the lord of chaos. He appears in art as a giant serpent. He is the opponent of light and ma'at, which means order or truth. This is where Freemasonry gets the phrase Ordo ab chao or order out of chaos. The sun god Ra, in the form of a great cat, kills Apophis. The great cat guards the tree of life, which held the secrets of eternal life and divine knowledge. The same story as the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Ezekiel tells us, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east and they worship the sun towards the east. Here we see the winged sun disk. The serpent is gnosis or knowledge. The sun is the eye, the all-seeing eye, the third eye, the pineal gland, illumination, kundalini. The wings are ascension to the higher realm. Car manufacturers have used this symbol through history because they're owned by the sons of Cain. 
Amran, the father of Moses, had a vision of two watchers, or fallen angels. They told him they each had three names. The first one said his names were Belial, prince of darkness and king of evil, and he had the face of a serpent. The other one said his name was Michael, the prince of light and the king of righteousness. Now we understand their duality. We know that Belial is Satan, the adversary, and Michael is Lucifer, the light bringer. And of course, that's a false light and fake righteousness. So why would Amran be having visions of watchers unless he invoked it? The Bible tells us the Lord told Moses to make a fiery serpent and to put it upon a pole. As we saw in part one, fiery serpent means a seraphim or nakash, which means shining one or serpent in the Garden of Eden. Seven or eight hundred years later, in two kings, we hear what Hezekiah, king of Judah, did when he found the Israelites still worshipping the serpent. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. The statue of Moses by Michelangelo shows him with horns. Horns are a symbol of the shining ones. Givora is on the left-hand path of Kabbalah. The numerical value of Givora, 216, is 6 times 6 times 6, 666. Six, six. The Torah was given to Moses and Israel from the mouth of the Givora. Moses' brother Aaron was the first Kohanim priest. He made the golden calf, a pagan idol. Then the Lord told Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miraculous sign, then you are to say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it in front of Pharaoh. It will become a serpent. We will follow the Kohanim priests through history and see how they connect to the dragon kings and the Knights Templar. Osasef was described by Maniso, an Egyptian historian, as a tyrannical high priest of Osiris, who leads an army of lepers and other unclean people against a pharaoh named Amenophis, or an Egyptian Amenhotep. The pharaoh is driven out of the country, and the leper army, in alliance with the Hyksos, ravaged Egypt, committed many sacrileges against the gods, before Amenophis returns and expels them. Towards the end of the story, Osasef changes his name to Moses. Pharaoh Amenhotep I was the son of Amos I, who expelled the Hyksos. The main gods of the Hyksos were Bala and Anat, originally of Phoenician and Canaanite origins. The Hyksos came to associate Baal with the Egypt Set. As we saw in part one, Josephus' description of the Exodus matches the expulsion of the Hyksos. The Hyksos honoured the serpent named Apophis. Was Moses really leading the Hyksos out of Egypt? Zadok was the Kohanim high priest when King Solomon was anointed. He reminds me of Wormtongue from Lord of the Rings. When King David was on his deathbed, Zadok helped Bathsheba convince him that Solomon should be king instead of Adonai. Solomon turned out to be an evil king. Zadok did very well out of it with his sons becoming princes. So the Kohanim priesthood had now married into the family of King Solomon. Now let's follow the line of Shem. Haile Selassie is an ancestor of King Solomon through Emperor Menelik I. Menelik I was the son of King Solomon. Haile Selassie's full title in office was by the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Elect of God. We can see how the bloodline of Solomon and the Kohanim priest is revered. First we see Winston Churchill giving Haile Selassie the Masonic handshake and a bow. On the right we can see Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip showing their respect. The Lost Tribes were ten of the twelve tribes of Israel that were said to have been exiled from the Kingdom of Israel after its conquest by the Neo-Assyrian Empire in 722 BC. In Peter's letter to the Lost Tribes, he writes, To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. All these areas are located on the south side of the Black Sea. 
Josephus wrote, the ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates till now and are an immense multitude and not to be estimated in numbers. 2 Estras says, they entered into the Euphrates by the narrow places of the river, for the Most High then showed signs for them and held still the flood till they were passed over. For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half, and the same region is called Arsareth. Georgian history records a community of Jews who migrated to Georgia during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC. The Book of Maccabees links the tribes of Israel with the Spartans in Greece. It has been discovered in a written record that the Spartans and the Jews are relatives and are both of the family of Abraham. Ezekiel was a Kohanim priest. He had a vision of Yahweh's chariot called the Merkabah. Gershom Sholem detected Jewish Gnosis in the imagery of the Merkabah, which can also be found in certain Gnostic documents. So we're now seeing a connection between the Kohanim priests and Gnosticism. The Old Testament God Yahweh rides a Merkabah chariot and he's attended to by cherubim. The cherubim had the face of a man, an eagle, an ox and a lion. The name Yahweh in Hebrew is yod heh vah which is symbolized as a swastika. The swastika is a symbol of the sun. The all-seeing eye or the eye of providence is also a symbol for the sun. In Gnosticism, Sabaoth is an archon and he creates a host of cherubim, just like Yahweh. Some books of the Bible call Yahweh, Yahweh Sabaoth. Is Yahweh actually a Gnostic god? Ezekiel had his vision in Babylon. On the left is a statue from Babylon of a lion crushing a man. The Lion of Babylon is associated with the goddess Ishtar. The lion is adopted later by the tribe of Judah. Following the destruction of Israel, the northern kingdom by Assyria in 721 BC, refugees came south to Judah, bringing with them traditions, notably the concept of Yahweh as the only God who should be served, which had not previously been known. There are several different sources for the text in the Bible. In the E source, God's name is always presented as Elohim or El until the revelation of God's name to Moses, after which God is referred to as yod heh vah often represented in English as Yahweh. The Elohist texts favour Israel over the kingdom of Judah and speaks negatively of Aaron, e.g. the story of the golden calf. So we have two contending texts and a separation between the Israelites and the kingdom of Judah. During the reign of King Josiah, he imposed the worship of Yahweh. It was King Josiah who hid the Ark of the Covenant and its contents, including Aaron's rod, the vial of manna, and the anointing oil, within a hidden chamber which had been built by King Solomon, and their whereabouts will remain unknown until the Messianic age. The location of these treasures was eventually passed down to the Knights Templar. Epiphanius wrote, by the time of the captives return from Babylon, these Jews had gotten the following books and prophets and the following books of the prophets. And you can see a list there on the right. And they have two more books of disputed canonicity, the wisdom of Syrac and the wisdom of Solomon, apart from the certain other apocrypha. So he thought them heretical. The Kohanim priests and their scribes wrote a lot of the Hebrew Bible. Ezra was a Kohanim priest and an apocalyptic writer, which is a type of Bible literature that emphasizes the lifting of the veil between heaven and earth and the revelation of God and his plan for the world. He was sent from Babylon to teach the Samaritans who influenced the Essenes. It has been suggested that the similarities between the Gospel of John and Gnosticism may spring from common roots in Jewish apocalyptic literature. Prophecy believes that this world is God's world and that in this world his goodness and truth will yet be vindicated. The apocalyptic writer despairs of the present and directs his hopes to the future, to a new world, standing in essential opposition to the present. They are following a divine plan, the book of Revelations, for a Gnostic new world order. Epiphanius says that Judaism split into seven heretical sects. Let's look at the scribes, Sadducees, Pharisees and Herodians. We can see the Kohanim priests and four of the heretical groups opposed to Jesus.
Epiphanius said, In Christ Jesus there is neither barbarian, Scythian, Hellene, nor Jew, but a new creation. He's listing four movements he calls heretical, or the bad guys. He says, From Adam until Noah there was barbarism. From Noah until the Tower, the Scythian superstition. From the Tower until Abraham, Hellenism. From Abraham on, the true religion which is associated with Abraham, Judaism, named for his lineal descendant, Judah. What he's saying is these sects or cults created by the line of Cain have been trying to influence the line of Seth since the days of Adam. So that brings us back to the Gnostic faces on the cherubim, the eagle, the bull and the lion. The symbols even match three of the four heresies listed by Epiphanius. A strange match, perhaps barbarism had the face of a man. In the 3rd century BC, there was a city called Scythopolis in Israel. According to Herodotus, the Scythians had a taboo against the pig, which was never offered in sacrifice, and they loathed so much as to even keep swine within their lands. Could the royal Scythians have married into the line of King David and Zadok the Kohanim priest? You'll see later why I asked that question. The Maccabean Revolt was started by a bloodline of Kohanim priests known as the Hasmonean dynasty. They were the ruling class over Jewish society. They pushed back against Greek oppression and succeeded in establishing an independent Hasmonean kingdom in Judah. Gnosticism is linked to Merkaba mysticism. Mendel Dubov explained that the portion of the Old Testament detailing Ezekiel's vision is the primary source for the Gnostic Jewish tradition known as Kabbalah. John the Baptist was a Kohanim priest. Epiphanius mentions another heretical group that came from Judaism through the Samaritans. They were known as the Essenes. Some scholars maintain that John the Baptist belonged to the Essenes. Eusebius wrote, 10,000 Essenes had been initiated by Moses into the mysteries of the sect. Simon Magus, or Simon the Sorcerer, was a disciple of John the Baptist. Surviving traditions about Simon appear in Orthodox texts such as those of Arrhenius, Justin Martyr, Hippolytus and Epiphanius, where he is often described as the founder of Gnosticism. Epiphanius wrote, he instituted mysteries consisting of dirt, and to put it politely, the fluids that flow from bodies. So were the Essenes Gnostics? We now know the phrase sons of light versus sons of darkness is a Gnostic phrase coming from the sons of Cain and Kabbalah. The Essenes were known as the sons of light and Jesus said, while you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Why would Jesus use a Gnostic phrase when we can see from Revelation 2.6 that he hated the Nicolaitans who were a Gnostic group? Notice this comes from the Gospel of John. Experts have argued that the opening theme of the Gospel of John, the pre-existing Logos, along with John's duality of light versus darkness in the Gospel, were originally Gnostic themes that John adopted. The teachings of Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke greatly differ from those in the fourth Gospel, the Gospel of John. Since the 19th century, scholars have almost unanimously accepted that the Johannine discourses are less likely to be historical than the synoptic parables and were likely written for theological purposes. In Mark, Jesus urges his disciples to keep his divinity secret, but in John, he is very open in discussing it, even referring to himself as I am, the title God gives himself in Exodus. When Moses asked for God's name, he replied, I am what I am. The phrase I am is used by the New Age, known as the I Am Presence. It now looks like the Gospel of John is a Gnostic text that's been added to the Bible. Although ancient traditions attributed to the Apostle John, the fourth Gospel, the Book of Revelation and the three epistles of John, modern scholars believe that he wrote none of them. The Gospel of John refers to an otherwise unnamed disciple whom Jesus loved, who bore witness to and wrote the Gospel's message. The author of the Gospel of John seemed interested in maintaining the internal anonymity of the author's identity. It has been widely believed that the author was the Apostle John, though some believe 
he was pretending to be. In the Gospel of John, there's a passage that's controversial because the passage is quoted by none of the Greek fathers who, had they known it, would most certainly have employed it in the Trinitarian controversies. According to Bruce Metzger, Erasmus promised that he would insert this text in future editions if a single Greek manuscript could be found that contained the passage. At length, such a copy was found or made to order. So why would the Gnostics insert this text? Because they've replaced the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost with the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost. The Word is the Logos from Gnosticism or New Age. John the Apostle was traditionally believed to be one of two disciples, the other being Andrew, recounted in John 1 to 39 who upon hearing the Baptist point out Jesus as the Lamb of God, followed Jesus and spent the day with him. Thus some traditions believe that he was first a disciple of John the Baptist, even though he is not named in this episode. There seems to be a rift between the followers of John the Baptist and the followers of Jesus. A translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls may indicate that one was waiting for a priest messiah and the others were waiting for a king messiah. James and John were cousins of Jesus and were also related to the family of John the Baptist. Notice the left hand with the two middle fingers connected together like an M shape. We'll be seeing more of that as we go along. Emperor Domitian commands the descendants of David to be slain. Here's Eusebius quoting Hegesippus, a second century Christian writer, the relatives of our Saviour. Of the family of the Lord, there were still living the grandchildren of Jude, who is said to have been the Lord's brother, according to the flesh. Information was given that they belonged to the family of David, and they were brought to the Emperor Domitian by the Evocatus, for Domitian feared the coming of Christ, as Herod also had feared it, and he asked him if they were descendants of David, and they confessed that they were. But when they were released, they ruled the churches because they were witnesses and were also relatives of the Lord, and peace being established, they lived until the time of Emperor Trajan. When the Sacred College of Apostles had suffered death in various forms, then the League of Godless Error took its rise as a result of the folly of heretical teachers who, because none of the apostles were still living, attempted henceforth with a bold face to proclaim, in opposition to the preaching of the truth, the knowledge which is falsely so called. They were having problems with Gnostics entering the church and pretending to be Christians and then twisting the meanings of the scriptures. Irenaeus warned the Christians about the Valentinians, who speak as we do, but think otherwise. He further states, and not only do they try to produce their proofs from the Gospels and apostolic writings, by twisting the meanings and tampering with the interpretations, even more cleverly and guilefully, they adapt what they like from the law and profits to their fabrication. Epiphanius says that the Borborites composed other Gospels in the names of the disciples. Irenaeus states that the Cainites regarded Cain as derived from the highest God. They also claimed fellowship with Esau and the men of Sodom. Fourth century historian Philaster maintained that these sects, along with the Sethians and Cainites, were specially united by having descended directly from the first instructor and serpent on the tree. Hippolytus claims that the Ophites taught that Christ did not exist in the flesh. They extolled the serpent and preferred it to Christ and that Christ imitated Moses' serpent's sacred power. Epiphanius says the Gnostics or Barbarites had a secret handshake just like the Freemasons. Gnosticism led to the New Age ideas of Christ Consciousness and Ascended Masters. They say Jesus is one of many Ascended Masters who reincarnate in human form throughout history. Epiphanius explains, This is because they maintain that Jesus is really a man, as I said, but that Christ, who descended in the form of a dove, has entered him, as we have found already in other sects, and been united with him. Christ himself is from God on high. But Jesus is the offspring of a man's seed and a woman. 
We can see the use of the dove in Ordo Templi Orientalis, the secret society started by Alastair Crowley. From 10 AD to 220 AD, the Kohanim priests of the temple became increasingly corrupt and were seen by the Jews as collaborators with the Romans. Leonard Nimoy, or Spock from Star Trek, is a Kohen or Kohanim. He proposed the live long and prosper hand sign for the show from the Kohanim blessing. It is also very similar to the Rockefeller hand sign used by celebrities. The Desbosony, or Fisher Kings, or Rex Deus, are alleged to be the surviving bloodline of Jesus. Malachi Martin, a Jesuit priest, said there was a meeting between Pope Sylvester and the Jewish Christian leaders, which took place in 318 AD. He says there were at least three well-known and authentic lines of legitimate blood descent from Jesus' own family. They demanded that Pope Sylvester replace the bishops with their own bloodline. The Pope dismissed their claims and said that from now on the Mother Church was in Rome and he insisted they accept the Greek bishops to lead them. This was the last known dialogue with the Sabbath-keeping church in the East, led by the disciples who were descended from blood relatives of Jesus the Messiah. Seven years later, after they kicked out the relatives of Jesus, they held the Council of Nicaea. The Roman Catholic Church used Jesus as their sun god and used Christianity as a veil of righteousness to persecute the Gnostics. Rome was against the Gnostics as it threatened the power of the church. The Gnostics had their texts removed from the Bible and were forced underground by Rome. Sol Invictus was a Roman sun god. In 274 AD, Emperor Aurelian dedicated the 25th of December to Sol Invictus. In 325 AD, at the Council of Nicaea, the 25th of December was declared as the birthday of Jesus. Helios, the Greek sun god, was known as the all-seeing, like the all-seeing eye. You can see Helios in the Vatican necropolis, along with Lucifer, the light bearer, and the Statue of Liberty, the Masonic sun god. Gifted in 1884 by French Freemasons, the Statue of Liberty's official title is Liberty Enlightening the World. It should be Lucifer, the light bearer. The image of Constantine with sun rays emanating from his head not only matches the earliest images of Apollo, it also matches the iconography of Mithras. And is it just coincidence that Christian art begins to depict Jesus the same way, with a halo of light around his head? Or was Constantine combining all the gods of light into one? When Constantine claimed to have had a vision of the Melvian Bridge, which religion was Constantine truly embracing? Did Constantine abandon paganism for Christianity? Or did he blend Apollo and Mithras into Jesus Christ and then refashion all three in his own image? As it turns out, when Constantine had his arch built, he topped it off with a bronze portrait of himself. Destroyed in antiquity, this statue depicted him riding the same kind of chariot as Apollo, seemingly taking off into sunny skies. The dragon kings from Japheth became the kings of the barbarian tribes. Over centuries, these tribal kings attacked the Roman Empire. In 476, the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire in Italy was deposed by a Germanic barbarian king. The imperial insignia was sent to the Eastern Roman Emperor. We will now follow the most ruthless, devious and manipulative branch of the Dragon Kings. The most important and most successful of these kingdoms was that of the Franks. Established in the 4th to the 5th century, the Frankish Kingdom grew to include much of Western Europe, developing into the early medieval Carolingian Empire and ultimately the Kingdom of France and the Holy Roman Empire. The Franks were known as Sicamba. This is seen in the text called Life of King Sigismund and Life of King Dagobert. From the Franks came the Merovingians. According to Fredegas Chronicles, the Merovingians originally came from Scythia, where they were known as Sicambrians, taking their name from Cambra, a tribal queen of about 380 BC. 
The Sicambrian line of Franks were named after their chief Francio, a descendant of Noah who died in 11 BC. Pharamond was the first king of the Frankish tribes. Before him, each tribe had its own king. The book Holy Blood, Holy Grail claims that Pharamond was the last of the Fisher kings. The Fisher king is claimed to be the keeper of the Holy Grail, which is described as a cup, dish or stone. The esoteric meaning may be the womb of Mary Magdalene and the bloodline of Jesus. Pharamond had Clodio, who had Merovec, the founder of the Merovingian dynasty. He had Childeric, who had Clovis I. The Chronicle of Fredega says that Merovec was born after Clodio's wife encountered a sea creature while bathing in the sea. This is similar to the Scythian story of Zeus and his union with a snake-legged goddess, and Melusine, the ancestor of the Dragon Kings. King Clovis I was baptised in 496 AD. Just before baptising Clovis, Saint Remigius gave him a prophecy. Your posterity shall nobly govern this kingdom, which will give much glory to the Holy Church. It shall inherit the empire of the Romans. One version says a white dove descended with the fleur de lis ampulla to anoint the king. This is the same Gnostic concept as the dove entering Jesus, the anointed one. The barbarian dragon kings and the Roman sun gods agree to disagree for their own mutual benefit. Senators become bishops and emperors become popes. The management model now turns from slavery to feudalism, with 90% of the population being serfs. The French monarchy adopted the fleur de lis for its royal coat of arms. So the fleur de lis stood as a symbol of the king's divinely approved right to rule. The thus anointed kings of France later maintained that their authority was directly from God. And that's King Louis XVI dressed as a sun god. Similar designs can be seen on a Scythian king's helmet from the 6th century and ancient Sumeria. The Habsburg dynasty is connected to the Merovingian dynasty through Childeric II. Adalrich, the Duke of Alsace, the founder of the Habsburg dynasty, invited Childeric II to take the kingship of Neustria and Burgundy in 673 AD. So now we can see two sides developing, opposed to each other, but mutually beneficial. The Pharisees of old became known as rabbis. Rabbinic Judaism has been the mainstream form of Judaism since the 6th century AD, after the codification of the Babylonian Talmud. Rabbinic Judaism has its roots in Pharisaic Judaism, and is based on the belief that Moses at Mount Sinai received two items from God, the written Torah and the oral Torah. The Khazars converted to Judaism in 740 AD. A 15th century rabbi records the conversion. I have been preceded by Rabbi Yitzhak Ha Sangarai, companion to the king of the Khazars, who converted through that sage a number of years ago in the land of Togama, as is known from several books. The rabbinic responsa and the valuable and wise sayings of this sage, which show his wisdom in Torah and Kabbalah. In 960 AD, in his letter to Hasdai, an Arab caliph, King Joseph of the Khazars stated that he was from the line of Japheth, from the seed of Togama, Japheth's grandson. He further stated that Togama, who was the brother of Ashkenaz, had ten sons, and the Khazars represented the seventh son. The Khazar kings occupy the same area as the Scythian kings before them. The ruling stratum of the Khazars, like that of the later Chinggisids within the Golden Horde, was a relatively small group that differed ethnically and linguistically from its subject people. Khazars are generally described by early Arab sources as having a white complexion, blue eyes and reddish hair. From the 4th to the 8th century, the papacy had to be approved by the Eastern Emperor. In the 700s, Khazar blood married into the line of emperors. Now back to the Scythian Frankish kings, distant cousins to the Khazar kings.
The Carolingian dynasty was a Frankish noble family named after Charlemagne. On the left we can see the Carolingian ancestors of Pepin the Short and Emperor Charlemagne and on the right the Merovingian ancestors. It is believed that Ansbertus and Bethilda were married, joining the two bloodlines. The Carolingian bloodline rose to power and in 751 the Merovingian dynasty was overthrown and Pepin the Short was crowned king of the Franks. Pepin the Short defended the papacy against the Lombards and issued the donation of Pepin, which granted the land around Rome to the Pope as a fief. In 754, Pope Stephen II had conferred on Pepin the dignity of Patricius Romanus, which implied primarily the protection of the Roman Church in all its rights and privileges, above all in its temporal authority, which means spiritual or political authority. The Byzantine's ability to protect the papacy had waned following the Arab conquests, leading the papacy to increasingly seek protection from the Franks. This culminated in 800 when Pope Leo III, who owed his power and position to the Franks, crowned Charlemagne as Emperor of the Romans. The map shows the extent of Charlemagne's Frankish Empire over Western Europe. The Franks are from the Seed of Japheth through Magog and Ashkenaz. On the north side of the Black Sea we see the Khazars, descendants of Japheth through Togarma. On the south side of the Black Sea we see the Eastern Roman Empire, where the Lost Tribes were last reported. Charlemagne was held as the new Augustus, but only German states in northern Italy were to be ruled under the Empire. Other Western European countries remained part of the Church, but maintained local secular rule and popes became rivals to the Emperors. The crown of Charlemagne, a replica of which is now part of the Imperial Habsburg Regalia, is said to have borne the inscription Rex Salomon, or King Solomon. So let's add Charlemagne and the Pope to our two sides. Prince Machir, the Nasi or Prince of the Sanhedrin. The Romans recognised the Nasi as Patriarch of the Jews and required all Jews to pay him a tax for the upkeep of that office, which ranked highly in the Roman official hierarchy. From the Sefer HaKabbalah, written about 1611, we read, Then King Charles Charlemagne sent to the King of Baghdad, requesting that he dispatch one of his Jews of the seed of royalty of the House of David. Prince Machir became chieftain there. He and his descendants were close, interrelated, with the king and all his descendants. So did Charlemagne marry into the Gnostic line of Solomon and the Kohanim priests? The Nasi were also prevalent during the 8th century Frankish kingdom. They were a highly privileged group in Carolingian France. Bryant Abraham in the De Domo e Familia David articles identify Machir ben Yehuda Zakai as Theodoric of Narbonne. Arthur Zuckerman also identifies Machir with Theodoric. Arthur Zuckerman claims descendants of Theodoric embodied a dynasty of franco judaic kings. Charles Martel, the grandfather of Charlemagne, had Alda of France. She married Prince Machir, also known as Theodoric. Wolfram von Eschenbach wrote Parseval around 1200 AD. Parseval's name appeared on the Grail marking him as the new Grail King. Wolfram claimed that Kiot the Provencal supplied additional material. Werner Grube, student of Rudolf Steiner, concluded that William of Jalome was Kiot the Provencal. Wolfram dedicated his work to Willehelm, or William of Jalome. Saint William of Jalome was the son of Prince Machir, or Theodoric. Wolfram links the Fisher King, the Holy Grail and the Knights Templar. Parseval arrives at Arthur's court, goes off on a quest to find the Grail and discovers a castle owned by the Fisher King and guarded by the Templese Knights. Wolfram's work indicates a number of possible patrons, most reliably Herman I of Thuringia. Cretien de Troy wrote Ivan, the Knight of the Lion in 1180. The story goes, a lion he rescues from a dragon proves to be a loyal companion and a symbol of knightly virtue. 
The lion is a symbol of the tribe of Judah, or the bloodline of King David, the Lion King. The dragon is a symbol of the bloodline of dragon kings from Cain. So we can see now how the barbarian Franks have switched sides to the light side and claim to be fighting their own dragon bloodline. Chrétien cites Marie de Champagne in his introduction for providing his source material for the book. Marie, Countess of Champagne, is linked through marriage to the family tree of Charlemagne. Chrétien de Troyes also wrote Lancelot, Percival and the Holy Grail. He dedicated the book to Philip I, Count of Flanders. He claimed to be working from a source given to him by Philip. Philip I, Count of Flanders, was a descendant of Fulk, King of Jerusalem. Chrétien de Troyes said the Grail is a bowl or dish. Wolfram von Eschenbach said the Grail is a gemstone. Robert de Boron said the Grail was Jesus' cup from the Last Supper, which Joseph of Arimathea used to catch Christ's blood at the crucifixion. San Graal or San Grael, meaning Holy Grail, by passing it as San Real, means royal blood. The Holy Grail is actually the unholy grail. It's the symbol of the royal Gnostic bloodline from Cain, an illumination. So we can now add Marie, Countess of Champagne, to the family tree. And Philip I, Count of Flanders. And finally, Herman I of Thuringia, who supported Wolfram von Eschenbach. Including Charlemagne's ancestor, Faramond, the alleged Fisher King, we have six connections to the Holy Grail, or the line of David, in this family. It seems logical to presume that the royal Khazars moved into Germany. Again, we're only concerned with the royal bloodlines, and not the population of people that follow them. From the 11th century onwards, Ashkenaz was associated with Northern Europe and Germany. Ashkenazi Jews are a Jewish diaspora population who coalesced in the Holy Roman Empire around the end of the first millennium. Just like their distant dragon king cousins, the Scythians, the ancestors of Charlemagne, they are claiming a link to Judaism. Here is a map showing the centers of Ashkenazi rabbinical culture in the 11th to 13th centuries. The Red Jews, a legendary Jewish nation, appear in vernacular sources in Germany during the medieval era from the 13th to the 15th centuries. These texts portray the Red Jews as an epochal threat to Christendom, one which would invade Europe during the tribulations leading to the end of the world. Andrew Gall studied the original German language text and concluded that the legend of the Red Jews conflated three separate traditions. The biblical prophetic references to Gog and Magog, the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel, and an episode from the Alexander Romance, in which Alexander the Great encloses a race of heathens behind a great wall in the Caucasus. In European culture prior to the 20th century, red hair was commonly identified as a distinguishing negative Jewish trait. From Charlemagne, we can follow his descendants to the house of Esther. Adalberto the Margrave was an Italian nobleman tied with the Obertengi family and a well-known ancestor to the Esther, Pallavicini and Malaspina family. The Obertengi were a prominent Frankish noble family in Italy. The dynasty is the progenitor of the house of Esther as well as the house of Guelph. The Esther family married into the Borgia, Habsburg and Sforza families. We will follow these three powerful families. Notice the eagle and ox or bull and lion symbols they use. Again, they match the heads of the cherubim and the three heresies they wrote about. These three families become the most powerful in the world. OK, let's add the House of Esther and the House of Guelph. Emperor Otto IV from the House of Guelph married Maria of Brabant. He used the double-headed eagle on his coat of arms, originally a Canaanite symbol. 
a direct male descendant of Otto, was King George I of England. The Knights Hospitaller, a Catholic military order started in 1099, now known as the Knights of Malta. Here are some of the more powerful family names that became Grand Masters of the order. The Pallavicini and Borgia family we've already met connected to the Esther family. The Orsini and Chigi family claim Roman ancestry. Godfrey of Bouillon was a Frankish nobleman and one of the preeminent leaders of the First Crusade. His brother Baldwin was crowned the first King of Jerusalem. After the Crusader states ceased to exist, the title of King of Jerusalem was claimed by a number of European noble houses descended from the kings of Cyprus or the kings of Naples. The Habsburg emperors of Austria used the title King of Jerusalem, as did the Savoyard kings of Italy, and the title is among those claimed by Philippe VI of Spain. Godfrey of Bouillon was a relative of Charlemagne. Godfrey of Bouillon is linked to the Knights Templar through Baldwin II, King of Jerusalem, who gave them the use of a section of the royal palace thought to be on the site of the Temple of Solomon. Now we can add Godfrey of Bouillon and Baldwin II. We can now see the close connection between the Templars, the Holy Grail and the royal dragon bloodline of Cain. Let's now add the Knights Templar and the Knights of Malta. The Knights Templar. Freemason Albert Pike wrote, the avowed objective of the Templars was to protect the Christians who came to visit the holy places. Their secret object was the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon on the model prophesied by Ezekiel. So they were the first Zionists. Now we know the royal families connected to the Knights Templar, married into the line of King David. It seems likely they were told where King Josiah hid the treasures in the Temple of Solomon. If we follow the Gnostic trail, we go from Moses and Aaron, the first Kohanim priest, to Zadok, Ezekiel, Ezra, and John the Baptist, all Kohanim priests. Simon Magus was a disciple of John the Baptist, and he taught Marcion. The Paulicians were influenced by Marcionism and Manichaeism. The Bogomils were influenced by the Paulicians, and they influenced the Cathars. Raymond VI of Toulouse and the Cathars. The Albigensian Crusade was called by Pope Innocent III against the Cathars, a dualistic religious movement in southern France that the Roman Catholic Church had branded heretical. Raymond VI of Toulouse was excommunicated for abetting the heretics. Raymond was implicated in the murder of a papal legate sent to investigate the situation. For Innocent III, that was the final straw. In March 1208, he called for a crusade against Raymond and the heretics of Languedoc, which began the following year. Raymond VI is related by marriage to Marie, Countess of Champagne, and more distantly to Philip I, Count of Flanders. There's a picture of Raymond VI and Moses on the ceiling of the Minnesota Supreme Court in America. This shows us the close connection this royal bloodline have to the Cathars and the Kahanan branch back to Moses. In the Cathar language of Old Provence, a female elf was an Albi, the name given to the main Cathar centre in Languedoc. This was in deference to the matrilineal heritage of the Grail dynasty, for the Cathars were supporters of the original Albigens, the elven bloodline, which had descended through the dragon queens of yore, such as Lilith, Miriam, Bathsheba and Mary Magdalene. The region were champions of the original concept of Grail kinship, as against the pseudo style of monarchy which had been implemented by the papal machine. Lilith was a demon goddess. Some texts say she was the mother of Cain. Miriam was the sister of Moses who watched him go down the river in a basket. When the Egyptian princess found him, she intervened and said, would you like a Hebrew woman to nurse the child? And then she got her mother. Bathsheba had Solomon and they claim that Mary Magdalene was carrying the child of Jesus. An association calling itself the Order of the Temple and claiming direct descent from the original Templar Order published two works, one in 1811 and the Leviticon in 1831. 
together with a version of the Gospel of St. John differing from the Vulgate. The Leviticon contains an esoteric lineage from Jesus to the Knights Templar and hints that Jesus was an initiate of the mysteries of Osiris, which were passed on to John the Beloved, and apostolic lineage was introduced into the church. Moses brought back the mysteries of Osiris and the all-seeing eye. The Gnostic heretics were against Jesus, so it looks like they're using Christianity as a cover. The mysteries and the hierarchic order of the initiation of Egypt, transmitted to the Jews by Moses and then to the Christians by J.C., were religiously preserved by the successors of St. John the Apostle. Jesus Christ wanted a universal civilization and the happiness of the world, rent the veil which concealed the truth from the people. It's the Gnostics that want a universal civilization. Christians are opposed to it. In 1812, the Order of the Temple formed the Johannite Church. The Johannite Church, initiated by the Baptist, transmitted by the Apostle and restored in the modern era, the Apostolic Johannite Church enacts the Johannite tradition through an esoteric Gnostic and Christian path of spiritual understanding and self-discovery. May the light of the sacred flame illuminate your path. If you hadn't already guessed, this is the bloodline of the Illuminati. This is a quote from someone on the Travelling Templar website. Being a Freemason and a Christian, the Owenite Church seems like a natural fit, since both St John the Baptist and St John the Evangelist play an important role in these institutions, and both revolve around an initiatic tradition passed down through the ages. See how people have been confused by clever wordplay into believing that Freemasonry and Christianity are compatible. These secret societies wrap themselves in a cloak of virtue and Christianity, donating to charities, building churches, schools and orphanages. They conceal their darker agenda, the duality of light and dark. Notice their logo with the eagle and the eye. Madame Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy, wrote in her book Isis Unveiled, the true version and the history of Jesus and early Christianity was supposedly imparted to Hugh de Payen, the co-founder of the Knights Templar, by the Grand Pontiff of the Order of the Temple, the Johannite sect, one named Theoclete, after which it was learned by some knights in Palestine from the higher and more intellectual members of the St. John sect, who were initiated into the mysteries. Freedom of intellectual thought and the restoration of one universal Gnostic religion was their secret object. Sworn to the vow of obedience, poverty and chastity, they were at first the true knights of John the Baptist, crying in the wilderness and living on wild honey and locusts. Such is the tradition and the true capitalistic version. The Gnostic belief system is in opposition to Christianity, so they have an ulterior motive for claiming a link to it. Albert Pike was a 33rd degree Freemason. In his book Morals and Dogma he wrote, the Templars, like all other secret orders and associations, had two doctrines, one concealed and reserved for the Masters, which was Johannism, the other public, which was the Roman Catholic. Thus they deceived the adversaries whom they sought to supplant. Pope Pius IX wrote against the Freemasons. He said that Hugh de Payen had been initiated into the mysteries and hopes of the pretended church. He was seduced by the notions of sovereign priesthood and supreme royalty, and finally designated as a successor. This is a Carolingian ivory plaque with the Eagle of St. John, one of the creatures envisioned by Ezekiel. John the Evangelist is the name traditionally given to the author of the Gospel of John. Christians have traditionally identified him with John the Apostle. One of John's familiar attributes is the chalice, often with a snake emerging from it. In his portraits, he often looks androgynous or feminine. So now we know why Leonardo da Vinci painted the Last Supper with an effeminate looking John and the shape of an M. It was a code for their secret Gnostic bloodline and the M probably stands for Moses or Mary Magdalene. It was claimed that the Templars had the head of John the Baptist and that they worshipped the Baphomet. Independently, in different parts of the world and under torture, they admitted to it, 
including spitting on the cross and elevating John the Baptist above Jesus. Many of the Templars in the outer circle knew nothing of it and revealed nothing under torture. The Baphomet is a symbol of illumination. The tattoos on the arms say Solve a Coagula, or Dissolve and Coagulate. Like the Gnostic Archons, it's hermaphroditic, male and female. The arms symbolise as above, so below from Freemasonry. These are terms from alchemy and Gnostic dualism. The Knights Templar were arrested in 1312. Many fled, but some joined other orders. It has been suggested that some became pirates, as the skull and bones was thought to be a Templar symbol. History records Templars may have been at the Battle of Bannockburn in Scotland. Roslyn Castle in Scotland contains Templar symbols. It was believed to have been built by the Sinclairs, whose original ancestry was French. The Declaration of Arbroath was a letter written to the Pope in 1320 by Scottish nobles. It was their response to the excommunication from the Church of King Robert I by the Pope. They are declaring their independence from foreign powers. Most Holy Father, we know and from the chronicles and books of the ancients we find that among other famous nations our own, the Scots, has been graced with widespread renown. It journeyed from Greater Scythia by way of the Tyranian Sea and the Pillars of Hercules, and dwelt for a long course of time in Spain amongst the most savage peoples. But nowhere could it be subdued by any people, however barbarous. Thence it came, 1200 years after the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea to its home in the West, where it still lives today. The Britons it first drove out, the Picts it utterly destroyed. And even though very often assailed by the Norwegians, the Danes and the English, it took possession of that home with many victories and untold efforts. And, as the histories of old time bear witness, they have held it free of all servitude ever since. In their kingdom they have reigned 113 kings of their own royal stock, the line unbroken by a single foreigner. Gnostic Templar Grand Prior Mark Amaru Pinkham presents the amazing history and teachings of the left-hand path which includes the world's Gnostics, alchemists, secret societies and mystery school initiates, and its continual battle with the patriarchal adherents of the right-hand path. He's talking about their continual battle with Rome. Mark begins with the Garden of Eden and the Gnostics' first instructor, the serpent, on the tree, and then traces the left-hand path down through the sons and daughters of Seth to the Essenes, Sufis, Knights Templar, Cathars, Freemasons and the Illuminati, as plans for the creation of a one world Gnostic civilization gradually unfold. We know the Gnostics revered Cain and the serpent on the tree, so it seems they are lying when they say they come from Seth. The final piece of the plan is destined to soon fall into place when the right and left hand paths come to a peaceful resolution of their ancient battle and work together to create a Gnostic civilization that is the union of both paths. The culmination of human civilization will then have arrived and all institutions and levels of society will encourage people throughout the earth to complete their spiritual evolution by achieving the goal of the Gnostic mandate, know thyself. My answer to them is know yourself and leave us alone. We will now continue following the family tree down through Otto I, Landgrave of Hesse. Following the male descendants of Otto I, we can see their name becomes Hesse Castle. In part three, you will see this family's connections to all the secret societies and a plot to infiltrate the Roman Catholic Church.